They say the honeymoon is supposed to be one of the best times of a person's life. Most believe the days immediately after marriage are seemingly perfect, leading most to expect the honeymoon itself to be nothing less. Believe me, I would have loved for this to be the reality, but sadly, that stereotype is far from the truth as my honeymoon was far from perfect and is nothing but a horrific memory I would soon like to forget. My name is Benjamin Case, and on November 5th, 2010, I got married. The days leading up to the wedding and the wedding itself mostly consisted of my wife's nervous breakdowns and nonstop planning, but in the end, it all worked out, and it was finally my turn to make sure the only thing I was in charge of worked out without a hitch. I had spent months prior thinking of where we should go for our honeymoon and what to do. I eventually remembered the countless times my wife mentioned to me how badly she wanted to visit Mexico City as it was her native land and she left at such a young age she could barely remember her culture. At that point, it was a no-brainer and I immediately planned for our honeymoon in Mexico City. We landed in Mexico two days after our wedding. My wife still had the ecstatic smile she got when I told her where we were headed plastered on her face. The package I booked for us online was a seven-day package. It set us up in a romantic resort on the outskirts of the town, alongside another couple and a single mother with her nine-year-old son. The beautiful resort stood alone and had a fairy tale view of trees and a lake around it. For the first five days, we were free to do whatever we wanted, so I took my wife on several tour buses and excursions to learn more on where she's from. We also went to see the carnivals and basically got a general feel of what her hometown felt like. In all of this, I noticed she couldn't stop smiling and seemed truly happy. At that point, I thought I'd completed my job and our honeymoon had been a success. But little did I know, it couldn't have been farther from the truth. Later that week, our resort manager informed us our package included a special experience for the last two nights. Well, guests, we do hope you have enjoyed staying with us this far, but it is finally time for me to tell you about the best part of your experience. Tomorrow night, we're going to have special performers coming to entertain you with our native dances and songs. This would, of course, all be during a feast of our best meals and cuisines. He paused to smile at us and continued with, The next night is usually an experience for everyone, but most enjoyable for the couples. This is because we take a deep trip in the forests late at night. I'm guessing the worried expressions on our faces were enough for him as he laughed and said, Don't worry. It's completely safe, unless you believe in all the myths. But around 11 p.m., some of the rarest and most beautiful fireflies come out to mate and in the process synchronize and create one of the most beautiful mating dances you'll ever see. It truly is beautiful. One of those things you need to see to believe. I was woken up later that night by my wife who was frantically looking around the room and had a terrified look on her face. Confused, I quickly asked her what was wrong. She quietly replied with, did you hear that? I looked around our room and listened intently trying to figure out what she meant at that time, but the room was nothing but deathly silent. I don't hear anything. I said. She responded with, I know, but I swear I heard someone crying. The look on her face suggested she was in no way playing a trick on me, so I simply hugged her and took a look around the room to assure that everything was fine. The next day came and went by quickly, and before we knew it, we were surrounded by exotic dancers and food. My odd interaction with my wife was still on my mind a bit, but she seemed completely past it now, as she seemed to be enjoying their native presentations and food. The activities and drinking had everyone asleep at around 10 p.m. I walked in from having a shower and decided it was time I went to bed. I put on my clothes and got in bed. Not long after, I could feel myself drifting to sleep, when suddenly I heard a loud scream from outside. The scream was followed by what seemed to be continuous wails, and I immediately got out of bed and ran towards the window. My initial thought was someone needed help, but all I could see were trees leading to nothing. I kept looking as I was certain I heard a scream, but no matter how hard I looked, there was absolutely nothing and no one. The next morning, I decided to ask the others if they also heard the loud wails I heard the previous night. They all had no clue what I was talking about, so I decided to pull aside the resort manager and ask him, as both my wife and I had heard the same thing, and there was no way we were both crazy. The manager didn't seem bothered by what I had just told him. 
He simply explained to me that some of the locals who had lived in the area for a while still believed their folk tales and sometimes tried scaring the people staying at the cabin by screaming at night. Something about the explanation didn't sit right with me, as I was sure what I heard the night before were the screams of something or someone in true pain. The day went by quickly again, and before I knew it, it was nightfall, and we were all headed into the woods to see the fireflies. My mind wasn't on what I heard the previous night, as I'd spent the entire day with my wife, and it being the last day of our honeymoon completely took my mind off whatever happened the previous night. We followed the resort manager till we got to an opening in the woods. A lake sat right in the center, and we all sat around it and waited for the fireflies as the manager said they would begin to come out around 10 p.m. We waited for about an hour around the lake when eventually the fireflies came out and it was truly one of the most beautiful things I'd seen in a while. The whole group watched them dance in silence, but that only lasted a short while as suddenly they began to frantically move around before all quickly leaving the lake. Confused, I decided to ask the manager what had happened. Hey man, did something happen? Before he got a chance to respond, the whole place was deafened by a large shriek similar to the one from last night. And from how clearly we heard the scream, it was obvious that we were not alone. Silence followed and everyone froze as we didn't really know what to do or expect. I could tell from the eerie feeling that began to fill the atmosphere that whatever made that noise wasn't human. A minute later, the silence of the woods was cut open again. But unlike last time, it sounded like someone was crying instead of screaming. Jackie, the single mother who was obviously now concerned for the safety of her son, decided to ask the manager if we could leave. But it was only then we noticed the horrified look on the resort manager's face as he mumbled the words, She can't be real. La Llorona. It can't be La Llorona. No one knew exactly what he was talking about at that time or why he wasn't doing his job in handling the situation. The cries of the woman were becoming louder, and as we all began to get up to leave, the manager let out a scream before running into the woods yelling, La Llorona! La Llorona! La Llorona! La Llorona! I was panicked now as we didn't have any clue on how to get back to our resort or why the manager had left us stranded. Suddenly, a tall woman dressed in a black veil began to walk out from the water. She stood around six feet tall, and the parts of her skin that weren't covered by the veil looked like decaying flesh. Josh, the nine-year-old boy, immediately began crying, and the rest of us stood frozen with fear. The woman continued to weep as she approached us, before suddenly standing still and pointing at something. I looked around to see what she had gestured at, but my heart completely sank as I saw she had pointed at Josh, who was now hidden behind his mother's back. Jackie immediately began to plead with the woman, saying, No, please, leave my boy alone. Take me instead. Please just leave my son alone. She was crying as she spoke, and the facial expressions of everyone around her indicated we all felt horrible about the situation, but knew there was nothing more we could do. The pleading only seemed to frustrate the woman as her cries only became louder. She then proceeded to approach Jackie and her son before offering a hand for Josh to take. The kid seemed to have entered a trance-like state as he suddenly stopped crying and put his hand in hers. Jackie held on to his other arm and cried without letting go. But in the blink of an eye, both the weeping woman and Josh were gone. Later that night, we found our way back to the resort where there was no trace of the manager at all. My wife was too scared to stay there now, so we said goodbye to the couple and hoped Jackie, who had stayed back by the lake, would be able to someday see her son again. The next day, we got on our flight back to L.A., and in the coming weeks, we were contacted by Jackie to help spread the word of her missing child. It's been 13 years now, and Jackie still hasn't received any news on her son, Josh. And no matter how many times I've told the story of the weeping woman who claimed a child during my honeymoon, everyone refuses to believe my horrific honeymoon story. The story I'm about to tell you may seem rather improbable, but rest assured that if my story were not hard to believe, I would not be alive. It all started that fateful Saturday. My wife and I had just gotten married and decided to start our honeymoon. This was my first day of honeymoon with her, and we were going to an island paradise on a beautiful cruise ship. 
Everything was going well until a strong storm hit the cruise ship with full force. The ship was going back and forth. Furniture and pictures were falling down. Children were crying and some parents with seasickness were vomiting so much that they couldn't calm them down. The captain gathered us in the main salon to give us some tranquility. The rain stopped after a few minutes, but the cruise ship lost its course. Out of nowhere, a loud bang on the bottom of the ship alerted everyone. The ship's workers went down to see what was happening, and in a few seconds, the screams began. Violent screams full of pain and panic covered every meter of the cruise ship. Then, silence. The captain told us to lock ourselves in our rooms. From there, the nightmare began. In a matter of minutes, the lights went out and the screams multiplied. When we thought of leaving the room, it was too late. The screams were getting closer and closer. Please help us! It's right behind us! Please! No! What should we do? Should we help them? No. We don't know what's going on. We could be in danger too. Especially if we go that way. And we are just going to stand here? No. For now, we should hide under the bed. Why? Because someone can be attacking us, like terrorists or something. Terrorists? In a cruise? I don't know, okay? But we really should hide. If we see water in the floor, the cruise is sinking. Then we should run upstairs, but only if that happens. Okay, you're right. What was it that was killing all the passengers? The noise came from below. Did a submarine hit us? Suddenly, my bedroom door exploded. My wife and I were hiding under the bed when we saw what came in. It was a miracle we didn't scream. A strange being was standing in front of us. It looked like an amphibian, but its legs were positioned like those of a human. It inspected the room for a while and disinterested. It left. We thought about staying hidden until the monster left, but we began to feel water brushing against our toes. The ship was flooding. We took a chance and ran out of the room, and when I turned around to look back, I saw it. It was a huge being more than two meters long. It was a huge amphibian with a huge toed head. When it looked at me, I noticed that it was swallowing a person. The victim was being swallowed without being chewed as if it was entering a black hole. The legs kicked desperately until suddenly they stopped moving and ended up entering the amphibian's mouth. Once it had devoured its prey, the creature began to run towards us. It was very fast and the big head start we had wasn't enough. In an act of desperation, I grabbed a decorative painting and used it to attack the monster and buy us some time. To my surprise, the monster dodged me without any difficulty. At that moment, I realized that I was about to die, exposed before this horrendous and dangerous being. But to my surprise, something much worse happened. The monster ignored me and kept running. He never chased me. He wanted my wife. My wife made it to the door, but before she could close it, the monster reached in. She used all her strength to try and close it, but it was obvious that she was giving in to the horrendous beam. As the monster was about to open the door, I hit it using the frame with all of my strength. Being distracted, it didn't dodge my blow, and I managed to stun it for a few seconds, which I used to go to my wife and close the door before it reached us. I told my wife to run that I would stay and lock the door, and if either of us let go, we would both die. She understood and ran desperately, and when she got far enough away, I let go of the door and started running. This time, I had no chance. The monster was too close and would catch up with me. I started to escape through the side of the huge cruiser, and when I was about to be the next victim of the amphibian, I jumped into the water, praying it wouldn't catch me. When I fell in the water, there was no trace of the monster near me, so I breathed a sigh of relief. There was no way it could catch my wife. Near me was a person with a life jacket. The man might have been protected from drowning, but he had a huge wound that cost him his life. I took the life jacket and looked up as a helicopter was arriving above me. I 
couldn't see well, but I recognized my wife inside the helicopter. After that, I swam away as I watched the cruiser sink. I didn't want to be near that monster when it happened. A few hours later, I had a stroke of luck, and a small boat found me and picked me up. When I got ashore, I tried every way I could to contact my wife, but it was to no avail. Neither she, nor any of the other passengers, ever showed up again. No one ever reported what happened to that cruise ship. It was as if it never existed. When I tried to raise my voice, I only received mockery and some insults on the networks. But outside of them, I began to see how some people were watching me. They didn't even bother to hide. It was as if they wanted me to know that they were watching me. I don't know who these people are or what will happen to me in the future. I just want to find my wife and forget what happened with that terrifying monster. But every time I close my eyes, I see it. I married the love of my life last month. It was a small ceremony, just our families and some friends. It was the most beautiful and happy day of my life. My husband Kevin is the most amazing guy. And the best part is like me, he too loves to travel and read. I met him in college and we instantly hit it off from there. And now, five years later, we finally tied the knot. We both have just got started in our respective careers so we don't have a budget to have a lavish honeymoon in France, Spain, or such destination. But my husband is a genius and knows many destinations where we could travel on a budget. I wanted to know where we were going for our honeymoon, but my husband wanted it to be a surprise, so I knew nothing about our honeymoon plans until the day we were supposed to leave. That's when I got to know that my husband was taking me to an island for our honeymoon. He knew that I was crazy for the beach, after living in Colorado my whole life, I was really excited to swim in the water on my honeymoon. It was fantastic how my husband managed to find an island for us to enjoy our honeymoon on. The island was somewhere in Europe, so we had to take a plane there. The moment we arrived, I knew this was going to be an amazing vacation. The sun was just about to set when we set foot in our room, and the open concept of the room made it easy to access the beach. Although I was tempted to jump in the water, I was too exhausted to do so. So I and Kevin decided to go for our first swim first thing in the morning. And so for the next four days, we had a great time. The small island had so much to offer. The hotel we lived at had so many activities that we enjoyed doing. However, on the fourth day, the staff at the hotel told us that we had to vacate our room as our stay was over. They told us that it was our last day there. How is that possible? Didn't you book for five days? Yeah, I did. Kevin said. It's not possible, sir. In our system, your booking is only for four days. The receptionist showed her screen to us, and sure enough, we were just booked for four days instead of five. Maybe I messed up the booking. Oh, God, this is terrible. Kevin said. It's all right, honey, I told him. He had already managed to make our honeymoon as memorable as it could be. How could I get upset at him for making a small mistake? It's all right, miss. Thanks for your help. But could we book a room for one more night? Our return flight is tomorrow, and we would love to spend one more night here. She checked into her system and said, I'm really sorry, but for the next two weeks, we are fully booked. Oh, that's terrible. So, is there any other hotel or resort we can spend the night in? I asked. I'm afraid this is the only hotel on the island. However, you can try some homestays. I do not know much about them, but I have heard things about them from the tourists who visit this island. We could just grab dinner, hang out by the beach, and then wait at the airport. Kevin suggested. Well, our flight is tomorrow afternoon, so it would be a long way to the airport. What if we try the homestay the receptionist mentioned about? It would be for just a night. But we at least would have a bed to sleep in before a 12-hour flight. It sure doesn't sound like a bad idea to me. Fine. 
let's check out the homestays. Within the next hour, we were forced to check out of our hotel. It would have been a very disappointing end to our wonderful honeymoon if we hadn't decided to explore the homestays. But little did we know that the last day of our honeymoon was soon going to be the most traumatic day of our life. Thankfully, the staff arranged for a taxi to drop us off at the city center from where we could be able to find a homestay to line in. Mind you, none of these homestays can be found on the internet. So the moment we stepped into the busy city center, we started asking around to know where to find a good homestay. That's when we met Sean. He was a local and willing to take us to a homestay. He seemed friendly, and we instantly liked him. So you guys came here from America to spend your honeymoon. And that's so sweet. Not a lot of tourists come to our island. Mostly they prefer Sicily or some other European island. That's when I told him that we were on a budget, and my sweet husband Kevin had planned the entire trip. That is really nice indeed. Haha, <laughs> here we are. He pointed towards a house right in front of us. This is my aunt's homestay. It's not as good as your hotel, but it's pretty cozy. I hope you like it here. It was a moderate-sized home, and a sweet-looking old lady was standing by the gate to welcome us. This is Mara, my aunt. Sean introduced us. The lady, Mara, smiled at us. Welcome to my home stay. Let me show you to your room. Sean will help you carry your stuff. It was just a home converted into a guest house. There were three bedrooms, and we were given the one down the hall. It was a pretty cozy and homely place to stay compared to our hotel room. The beach is just a few yards away, and you'll just have to walk through the tree line for a bit to reach the shore. Feel free to go for a swim any time. Sean informed us all. I will cook you lunch and dinner if you want, or you could always eat at one of the small restaurants in the market. Mara told us. We'd love to eat your food if it's not too much trouble. Oh, it's no trouble at all. I'll cook something delicious for you while you go rest in your room. And we did just that. We took a nap in our room. A knock on the door woke us up. Lunch is ready. It was Mara's voice. I and Kevin went to the dining area, and a feast was waiting for us. We devoured the food, and it was pretty tasty. But soon after we were done, we both started feeling dizzy and sleepy. We thought maybe having our stomachs full was the reason we felt sleepy, so we went to our room and slept. When we woke up, I walked out to find Mara or Sean, but the lights were out and the house looked empty. When I returned to my room to wake up Kevin, I noticed that all of our stuff was gone, along with all of our money and our passports. We had been drugged and was unconscious by Mara and Sean. The moment Kevin and I realized that we were scammed, we decided to go to the police and connect with the U.S. Embassy. But the moment we tried to open the door, we realized that the doors and windows were all locked from the outside. Before we came here, I had noticed that this house was pretty secluded from the other homes, so chances are no one will hear our cries for help, and we'll be stuck here probably till tomorrow morning, and we might miss our flight too. Kevin is trying to find a way out, but I don't know. We are stuck here for a long time. What do you guys think we should do? With all of our money and passports gone?